Welcome to everybody. Hopefully we are live on Facebook now. Let's see. Yay, okay. We are live on Facebook now and on Zoom. So welcome everybody joining us um, on both Facebook and Zoom. Um, this is our fifth in our Understanding Nature uh, virtual series. Um, I'm, I'm really happy, really excited that these have been as, as popular. Um, you guys have been great. Um, people asking for more, so we'll keep going. I'm Tim here at Fontenelle Forest, and today we're going to talk about the top mammalian predators in Nebraska. So when I was talking about um, developing this program, one of my office mates kept saying, well, well, what about eagles? Well, what about lizards? Well, what about snakes? I said, well, geez, we have to, we have to cut it off somewhere. So, so we're going to talk about the top mammalian predators. So foxes, coyotes, uh, bobcats, and lynxes. Or sorry, bobcats and mountain lions, not lynxes. Um, so the one thing, as I started developing this program, originally when I thought about foxes, I was only thinking about red foxes. But as I started to do this research, um, I kind of got fascinated with this little guy. This is the swift fox. And I'm just gonna talk briefly and show you a, a brief little video about the swift fox. And they're really kind of neat because they're, they're actually the smallest wild canid in North America. So the smallest canine that we have in North America. They're about three to seven pounds. So really not much bigger than a, than a big house cat. Um, 27 to 32 inches from nose to tail. So not even three feet from the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail. And they stand about a foot tall at the shoulder. Now, historically, swift foxes were found um, across the Great Plains. So you can kind of see this dotted line was kind of their historic range. So they would have been found um, throughout Nebraska. Um, but now they're only found kind of on that western edge. So they are, they are considered endangered in the state of Nebraska. Um, they're found only over here in the southwest corner and up into the panhandle. So they really require that short grass prairie environment, um, the, no trees. Um, they use a lot of abandoned prairie dog burrows uh, for, their, for their own dens. Um, they live about three to six years in the wild, but they can live up to 14 years. They eat a lot of small mammals, so mice, ground squirrels, that sort of thing. Um, they also eat um, berries, they'll eat grasses, they'll scavenge. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a short video about the swift fox. Rolling grassland of western Nebraska is a vast and seemingly infinite space. Part of the western high plains, the region is known for howling winds, large farms, and few humans. It's also where a species native to the high plains is fighting for survival. My name is Lucia Corral. I'm a student from University of Nebraska at Lincoln. I'm part of the Nebraska Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Corral came to Nebraska on a Fulbright scholarship from Guatemala. She has her master's in wildlife ecology. For her doctorate, she's tracking down one of Nebraska's most elusive predators, the aptly named swift fox. A swift fox is the smallest canid species in the northern Great Plains. Uh, it's a very small fox, the size of a cat, basically, a domestic cat. It's known taller than 12 inches, and it's about the size of a cat. It's really small. It's yellowish color, yellowish grayish, with more white in the belly and in the inner parts of the body. A nocturnal creature, swift fox are considered an endangered species in Nebraska. Most of the historical evidence about them is anecdotal, and spotting one in the wild is rare. For the last year and a half, Corral has been trying to pinpoint where exactly swift fox are calling home. 
but since she's searching an area the size of West Virginia, Corral needed to develop a system to gather the necessary data. To do that, she and her research assistant, Alan Harrington, are using camera traps. That has less bitch. Well, the cameras are motion censored cameras. Um, they also have a, a heat sensor, thermal sensor on there. So um, any detection to set off the camera is gonna be through motion or heat. Camera locations are chosen based on a variety of factors, like the size of the property, the landscape, and land use. Existing structures close to game trails work best. Let's face it, sweet foxes try to avoid tree lines, usually, and they move more in open areas, relatively flat areas with short grass, uh, trying to avoid predators like coyotes. In front of each camera, a stake is driven into the ground and scent lures are set. In this case, skunk scented petroleum jelly. And what about the smell of skunk? The smell of skunk, it's it's great. I actually really love it now. Um, you know, initially you're kind of like, whoa, it hits you in the face, but once you greet it every day, it just really becomes a part of you. Corral and Harrington have set up cameras at more than 1,250 locations in 24 counties, gathering hundreds of thousands of digital images. More than 25 species of mammals and several bird species have also been documented. Swift fox have been seen at 33 different locations. But we have found foxes in the habitats that we know they are suitable habitat for the species. Um, you know, short grasses, mixed grasses, open areas, flat areas, uh, pastures with uh, cows, cattle, overgrazed pastures, uh, loamy, sandy soil, which is, uh, it's good for them to, they live in the end, so they also select for places with those kind of soils. Corral says depending on its location, a swift fox den could impact future human developments as well. So it's important to have the basic information to do any informed decision, to do any, any, any type of management or conservation. We need to have the basic information where they are and why they are selecting those areas and how they move in, in the landscape and how they are doing in terms of population. So this is kind of the basic we need to know, how many and where. And that's why we are just starting with the distribution map where we can find them driving hundreds of miles a day, getting in and out of trucks, pounding skunk scented steaks into the ground. Place to put the steak. <laughs> Looks good. It's taxing work, but necessary. They have been around and we don't know much about them here in Nebraska in terms of distribution and abundance of the species. Perfect. But we need to know because it's part of, it's one of those pieces in the puzzle that makes the ecosystem be, uh, keep functioning. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Now I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say um, skunk scented petroleum jelly, if anybody is, you know, in the market, is probably not available at Walgreens or CVS. That's, I'm going to guess that's a special order product. So now we're going to talk about the red fox. So the red fox is the largest of the true foxes. So they're about 8 to 10 pounds on average. Um, they, they're about 30 to 57 inches. So somewhere between two and a half feet, um, not quite six feet from the, the tip of their nose to the tip of their tail. And they stand between 14 and 20 inches tall at the shoulder. A female fox is called a vixen, a male fox is called a dog, and then the young are called kits. Now they are the most widely distributed carnivore actually in the world. They, they're found across the entire Northern hemisphere, um, down into parts of Africa, they're very adaptable. They've actually been introduced into Australia, and because they're so adaptable, they're, they're now considered an invasive pest in, in Australia. 
Um, now they've been pre they're present in across Nebraska, except for the very driest parts of the sand hills. And if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked all about the sand hills. Um, so in the driest parts of the sand hills, their populations get a little bit hot. Otherwise, um, they're present across Nebraska. And one second. All right. So, they, like I said, they're the largest true fox, but they're still lighter in weight than a similarly sized dog. Now, the, the red fox, the average lifespan of the red fox is between two and five years. So now their senses are interesting. So they have, like most, like most canids, they have binocular vision that reacts to movement. Um, but they have incredible hearing. So they can actually hear a mouse squeaking from 100 yards away or hear a crow flying, not, not cawing and making noise, but just flying from about a third of a mile. And because their hearing is so acute, they can locate the source of that sound within one degree. And their sense of smell is good, but it's still weaker than some dogs. Now they actually have something special with their vision too that I'm gonna show you in a minute. So hunting and diet, um, foxes, red foxes are omnivores. So they, they primarily eat small rodents. So voles, mice, um, ground squirrels, squirrels, um, woodchucks, anything up to about eight pounds. So that can include also raccoons, possums, rabbits, um, insects but they'll also eat plants and fruit. So actually in the fall, um, in some places where, where berries are plentiful in the fall, berries will make up almost 100% of their diet during that time when those berries are in season. So pretty amazing. Now foxes are carnivores. And I'm gonna show you here for just a second. Um, this is my fox pelt here. You can see that that nice red color. And then this is not a real skull. This is called a repless skull. So you can see they have those, car they're called carnassal teeth. The carnassal teeth are common in predators and they, they don't have molars like we do. We have molars because we chew our food. They don't really chew their food, but they tear it. So carnassal teeth, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but they, they fit together almost like a scissors, almost like a serrated um, pair of scissors. The, the upper and lower molars kind of come together and they, they have that serrated edge for tearing. Now the thing that's special about Fox vision is that they can actually see the Earth's magnetic field. And it's really, really cool. So let's go back to our YouTube. And I'm going to show you another. Yeah, so how cool is that? I mean, that just blows my mind. It's awesome. It is awesome. I agree. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and talk up a little bit because it sounds like maybe some people are having trouble hearing me. Um, so I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Um, red fox social life. So outside of the breeding season, um, red foxes just live in the open. So they use dens during the breeding season um, for having their puppies and um, having their pups and, and sheltering them. So but they'll usually only use dens the rest of the time in bad weather. So they live in a family group, they share territory, and the average territory for a fox is about two to three square miles, so not very big. Um, they, young may leave their families if they, if they have a chance to, to take um, a territory of their own. If not, they'll stay with their family and kind of postpone their own reproduction. So non-breeding vixens will, will help guard the kits. They'll help um, play with them, groom them, bring them food, retrieve them if they get too far away from the, 
the den. Um, foxes will usually have one litter per year, which averages about four to six kits. Um, they might have more up to about 13. It just kind of depends. Usually they'll have a larger litter in places where mortality is high. So if not, a, a lot of the young don't survive, they might have a larger litter. Uh, mothers will remain in the den with the kits for the first couple weeks while father brings food. So that's pretty nice. Dad will bring food. And then after about three to four weeks, the kits will leave the den. Um, I had a question about um, living adjacent to Fontenelle Forest um, with small dogs. Are foxes a threat to pets? Um, and, and we'll get to that. So I'm, I'm going to address that question in just a second. In fact, we're going to talk about urban foxes right now. So urban foxes, foxes are highly adaptable. So they actually live quite well in cities, um, especially areas that have a lot of, of larger parks, golf courses. I've seen them on golf courses around here in Omaha. Um, they'll den in undisturbed areas. I've gone to some um, retirement homes for programs and they've told me about foxes denning under um, garages and sheds, things like that. Um, they will scavenge trash and um, a lot of times on golf courses when people see them, people will you know, throw them food. Not a real good idea because they, they can continue to hunt and find prey. We have a lot of rabbits, a lot of squirrels, a lot of small game that foxes can survive on. Um, but if they lose their fear of people, then we might start to have issues. So they may attack your small dog um, if they're, you know, if they're available. They may attack a cat. Now they don't usually do that. It's not really normal. They tend to see cats or other dogs more as competition than as prey. Um, but the other thing is that the foxes can carry diseases. So they can carry rabies. They can carry mange or fleas or things like that that you don't want having in your backyard. Um, and they also actually may come to rely on handouts from people and stop hunting on their own. And that makes them more susceptible to starvation and to disease. So we don't want that. Um, another question, is it good to have a fox around your house? Um, the, the presence of foxes and other predators is actually a sign of a healthy ecosystem. So as long as you're not concerned about um, pets or, you know, like I have chickens, you know, we've all, we've all heard the, the phrase, a fox in the hen house. So that's something I want to avoid. So it's, I mean, it's not necessarily bad to have a fox around, but you just want to be careful about if they're sick. Um, they, they don't usually um, attack people unless they're guarding kits or if they're sick. Um, so you just want to be careful about that. Make sure you're not, you know, giving them handouts and things like that. So next we're going to get into one of my favorite animals, the bobcat. So this, uh, this is a pretty good sized kitty, 14 to 40 pounds. And again, um, and this is kind of a common theme, these range throughout North America and they, so they tend to be larger in play, in the northern part of their range and smaller in the southern part of their range. That has a lot to do with, with winters, with game, because in, in the winter, farther north, they're going to have to take down larger game. So they, they are larger um, to compensate mm -hmm. for that. So 22 to 57 inches, so somewhere between two feet and, and not quite five feet from head to tail. And their tail is only about um, three and a half to eight inches. So it's a stubby little tail. Um, between one and two feet tall at the shoulder. Now I have, I also have my, uh, my bobcat pelt here. And you can see that and it's got those, those beautiful spots on its, on its belly. And that helps it camouflage. And these are, this pelt is, it's just like petting a house cat. It's super soft. And then I also have, and this is actually a real bobcat skull. So this is my bobcat skull. And you can see again, those, those carnassal teeth, how they fit together. 
Because cats, unlike the, the fox, cats are strictly carnivores. They, they eat nothing but meat. Let's get back here. Average lifespan of a bobcat in the wild is about seven years. Um, they, can, they can get older, but they rarely live past about the age of 10. And like your house cat, they have excellent vision, um, very good night vision. Um, they have a decent sense of smell and very good hearing. So just like your house cat that you might have at home, but, but scaled up. Now they are, they are generally what we call crepuscular. Crepuscular means that they're most active at dusk and dawn. So during the winter and fall, you actually might see them out more during the day, and that's because their, their prey is more active during those times. So you might actually see them out more during the day in the fall and winter. Um, normally they'll move between, they'll travel between two and seven miles um, along kind of a habitual route, usually starting about three hours before sunset uh, up until about midnight, and then they'll rest for a while, and then just before dawn to about three hours after sunrise. They're, they're out moving around. We do have these, um, we do have bobcats around here. We have them um, probably in the forest, um, but I know uh, the neighborhood just north of the forest, uh, someone posted not too long ago on the, the Ring app, they had captured, or on the Nextdoor app, they had captured a bobcat on, on a trail camera. Now, bobcats tend to eat smaller prey, uh, squirrels, um, sometimes geese, um, insects. Um, they really like rabbits, and they can go long periods without eating. And, but then when, when prey is available, when they do make a kill, they'll eat heavily. So that's, and that's common in a lot of our predators. They don't always make a kill, but when they do, then they, they really stock up and eat a lot. Now, during lean times, if they can't catch smaller game, they might try to take down larger game, like small deer. But usually it's a, they're, they're an ambush predator. So usually it's a, a pounce or a, a very short chase. Now, bobcats can find themselves to pretty well-defined territories. Oops. Trying to get my chat back up. But I'm not, it's not coming for me. So bobcats can find themselves to pretty well-defined territories. Um, the size is pretty much determined by prey abundance. So they'll mark their territory by urine scenting feces and they'll also claw trees. Um, they like, they have numerous places to shelter. So they'll usually have a main den and that's probably what this is here in the, this top picture is kind of the main den. And then they'll have several auxiliary shelters kind of around the fringes of their territory. Territory size range is estimate um, anywhere between a quarter of a square mile, which is very small, up to about 125 square miles. So they are solitary, but the male may have a very large territory. So male territories tend to be larger than the females. Um, females' territories tend to be about half the size. So a male's territory may overlap or encompass um, up to two or more females. So generally the bobcats will have between two and four kittens in the springtime. The kittens will start exploring by about four weeks old and by about three to five months, they're out traveling with mom. And then usually by the fall of that same year, they're dispersing, setting out on their own. Um, and mom may actually have a second litter in the fall. It's not unheard of. So like foxes, bobcats are very adaptable. Um, so urban living, their range is generally not limited by people as long as they can find suitable habitat, suitable places to den, and enough game to feed themselves. So really only large, very intensively cultivated areas 
or developed tracks are unsuitable for bobcats. So they may show up in, in yards, especially around the urban edges. Um, they may prey on domestic animals um, like chickens or geese, sometimes even uh, rabbits or goats, but they tend to be shy. Um, and again, people always worry about attacks by animals like this. Attacks are very rare. It's usually only sick cats, um, usually rabies, um, that, that will cause them to, to attack humans. Another one of my favorites, we've talked about this guy a couple times. Um, this is the coyote. So a coyote's average lifespan is about 14 years. So they can actually live quite long. Um, 20, anywhere between 20 and 50 pounds, um, four feet, four to five feet or, or so from head to tail, and about two, uh, two to two and a half feet tall at the shoulder. Sorry, my tongue got away from me there. And again, they tend to be larger in their northern range. So, and they can run up to about 40 miles an hour. So I'm going to show you here. Show you my, my coyote pelt. And again, you can see that, that brown, that tannish color. And we're going to talk about their, their traditional range and how this, you'll see how this color would be very camouflaging. I'm just going to address a couple of questions now that I got my chat back. Um, someone has told me the incidence of rabies and foxes is not high in our area. So that's good to know. Um, skunks and raccoons are a bigger problem. So it's still a good idea to give them a wide berth. And that comes from a veterinarian. Um, uh, somebody else asked, does the bobcat have the same capabilities for hunting using the Earth's magnetic field? No. Um, at this point, the... The fox is the only one that we know of that uses the red, the magnetic field for hunting purposes. So my coyote skull is here. And again, you'll see those, those carnassial teeth. So that's the coyote and, and this is the fox. So really not much difference in skull size. but definitely a difference in, in body size. Ah, and there I got my chat window to come back up so I can see. So historically, coyotes were limited to the Great Plains. They, they really, prior to 1700s and, and European settlers, this middle part right here was where coyotes were. And so you can see, you can imagine how that brown, that tannish colored pelt would blend in with the dry grasses of the Great Plains. Now, after 1700, as, as European settlers started to move west, um, they eliminated a lot of the coyotes' competitors. So, so wolves, and we, if you were here from my wolf program, you know how we, we eliminated wolves as we moved across the country. The, the white settlers, the European settlers didn't care for wolves. So they eliminated the wolves, they eliminated the bears, or they at least reduced their numbers. Um, they eliminated or reduced the numbers of mountain lions. And all this allowed the coyote, who was very adaptable, to, to expand its range. So as those large predators were eliminated, the coyotes moved east and they, and they moved west and they expanded their range. So one of the reasons that they were able to do that is because they're, they're opportunistic hunters. The coyotes will eat almost anything. So small game, rabbits, squirrels, groundhogs, um, rodents, mice, frogs, fish, they'll scavenge, um, they'll eat berries, they'll eat grass. Um, ranchers don't like them because they will attack um, livestock like chickens, they'll attack lambs, they'll attack sheep. 
So historically, they've been regarded as a pest, and there was even there have even been bounties on them. Now, the thing about coyotes is because they're so adaptable, trapping, killing, these things really don't impact coyote numbers all that much. So the only thing that really limits their their population is is game abundance, food abundance, and so. If you look at places like Yellowstone, when we talked about wolves, we talked about coyotes and wolves in Yellowstone. With a lot of wolves around, coyote numbers were reduced. And that's because they were competing for a lot of the same game and wolves would actually prey on coyotes to a certain extent. Now the basic social unit of, of the coyote is the pack. Now the pack, just like wolves, tend to be a family unit. So it generally consists of a, a reproductive female. Um, but coyote packs, unlike wolf packs, coyote packs tend to be somewhat temporary. So for the most part, coyotes, they go out and do their thing um, by themselves. Occasionally they will, they will um, form a pack. These are usually in the fall and they do that sometimes for companionship it seems and sometimes to, they'll get together and work together to bring down larger game. But for the most part, those, those packs are only temporary. Now a female in heat can attract up to seven males and they will follow her around for a month, which, you know, that's, that's how we men are. Um, but once the female selects a mate, the other males will go elsewhere. They'll go looking for a mate somewhere else. And the, the newly mated pair will establish their own territory. Now, females that fail to find a mate may stick around with the pack and they'll help um, with raising the kits and, and protecting them and feeding them. Um, so frequently they'll, they'll either dig a new den, the newly mated pair will dig a new den, or sometimes they'll take over um, an abandoned den from some other animal, like a porcupine or a badger or a groundhogs, um, something like that. Now, during the pregnancy, which is about two months, the male will, will feed the female. He'll bring her food. Um, coyote territories range between an eighth of a square mile up to about 24 square miles. But coyotes, unlike wolves, coyotes don't really defend their territory. So outside of the breeding season, when they might, um, they might defend their territory during the pre breeding season, but the rest of the time, they're pretty nonchalant about it. And even when they do defend their territory, they're much less aggressive than wolves. They very rarely um, will kill an, an intruder or a, a rival coyote. They just, they fight long enough to drive them away. Whereas wolves, that's, that's oftentimes a, a fatal attack. So I had a question about when coyotes howl at night, what are they? communicating. And I'm glad you asked because that is my next slide. So let's take a listen for a second. So coyotes have been described as one of the most vocal mammals in North America. And I actually read once that coyotes have more distinct vocalizations than any other land mammal except for humans, which I find amazing. So they, they engage in a number of different sounds and, and kind of what she's heard there is, I, I actually heard something very similar to that last night. I live right here near Fontenelle Forest and the coyotes were yipping and howling at about 10.30 last night. Sorry, I laughed because someone said that made their dog bark. Um, so the howling and the yipping is they will communicate with others in the pack. So sometimes it's to, to gather the group together or just to find out where everybody's at. Um, sometimes they think it, it's kind of a, a way of saying, hey, I'm here, um, usually males hey, I'm here, females, you're welcome to join me, you're welcome to stick around. Any other males, this is my territory, you need to leave. Um, and they actually think that it's the other males answer back to let the, the male who owns the territory, if you will, 
know where they're at so they don't accidentally run into each other. Um, some of the yelping is sort of a celebration. So a successful hunt, they might yip and, and yelp and bark a little bit. Um, sometimes it's a, maybe a criticism, usually within small groups, often heard um, amongst the pups when they're playing. Um, barking, so they will actually bark. And Canis latrans, which is the scientific name for um, the coyote, it actually means barking dog. And so that's usually a threat. When they bark, it's a threat. It's a, a defense of um, the den or a defense of their a kill, maybe. And then they also do um, something that's called huffing, which seems to be a, a way of calling the pups without making a lot of noise. I was thinking about it earlier. It's like the mom whisper when you're, you know, got your kids in the store and you go, you better knock it off or I'm gonna, you know, that's, it's that, it's that huffing. Um, so I had a, a, some comments here on the chat. Um, someone says they have two packs behind their acreage. One is more north and one is more south. Sometimes it sounds like they're calling back and forth to each other. And that's, that's probably true. They probably are. They're probably letting each, each other know where they're at. So I'm, I'm over here. And they're saying, well, I'm down here. And so that way they don't ac accidentally overlap when they don't want to. Um, when a coyote mates, how long do they stay together? I think it's just for that breeding season. I would have to look that up because I didn't write it down. Um, but I think after that, after the, the female gives birth, I think the, the male probably disperses and, and goes off. And maybe he comes back in a year, maybe not. Um, so again, our coyotes are quite adaptable. So they can make territories out of a patchwork of green space. Um, so again, those golf courses, those, those parks. Now coyotes and foxes, coyotes um, suppress foxes. So if there's more coyotes, there's gonna be fewer foxes. Just like, just like wolves suppress coyotes. So now in urban areas, they may feed on trash. They, they may feed on squirrels. Um, they, they will sometimes kill small dogs um, and cats, but that sounds like a bad thing. Now, there's, there's, some, there's some debate on whether or not coyotes actually eat stray cats or not. And I think it must, it might depend on the availability of feral cats. So one study said they found only about 1.3% 1, 1 of, of their urban coyotes diet consisted of cats. Um, another study that was in Los Angeles um, estimated it more at about 20%. So there's some, there's some debate there. But what is known is that they do help control the populations of other species that are a problem in urban environments. So things like geese, maybe some deer, some rodent species, and they even do decrease at least the, the numbers of free roaming cats, which in turn protect songbirds. So I think I find that, that relationship kind of interesting. Um, someone says they live out by Lake Zerinsky and there's been an increased coyote presence. So they, it seemed, they seem to see foxes being pushed out from that area, and I, and I don't doubt that. Um, attacks on people by coyotes are rare. So if you're like me, you kind of love the Nextdoor app because sometimes it provides a, an endless stream of entertainment. So I live near, near Fontenelle Forest and every so often somebody will get on the Nextdoor app and they'll post, I saw coyotes and they and and people because they don't understand coyotes, they they get fearful. Um, so I, I try to get on there and, and counter with some facts. Well, one fact is coyotes very rarely attack people. The average number of uh, of coyote attacks on people in the United States in the whole country, the average number of attacks is six per year. So that's the entire country. Generally, those are, are animals that are sick. Um, there hasn't been a death from a coyote attack in the United States since 1981. So take some comfort in that. 
Now, a lot of times people, again, they will, they will feed coyotes or they, they think they're neat, which they are, but they'll put out, say, dog food or something like that. So it's actually been shown a lot of the coyote attacks that have occurred in the United States occur where people have been feeding the coyotes or are doing things to um, reduce the coyotes' fear of people. So one of the things they talk about doing in order to prevent these things is it's hazing, which is basically scaring the coyotes, making sure the coyotes stay fearful of people. And that's a way that you can, can make sure that they, they um, don't attack your pets or don't attack your children or you. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a quick video here on what to do, how to handle it if you do encounter a coyote. Whenever Roadrunner encountered Wile E. Coyote, he would usually just drop something heavy on the guy's head. Problem solved, right? But in real life, coyotes aren't exactly trying to eat us all the time. And even if they were, dropping an amble on them really wouldn't be the answer. So what should you do if you're out walking the dog on a lovely summer evening and you suddenly encounter the big bad coyote? Well, according to the Mercury News, it's important to remember that coyotes are wild animals and should always be treated with caution and respect. Most coyotes are wary of people. In fact, most most of the time, you can drive a coyote away just by standing your ground and making yourself appear threatening. If you encounter a coyote while walking your dog, however, the first thing you should do is rein in your pet. If your dog is small, pick it up. If your dog is on the larger side, shorten the leash and keep the animal close to you. Stand tall and stare down the coyote. If that's not enough to make it move on, you can also shout or throw a rock. But avoid turning your back on the coyote, or worse, running away. Someone who is running away might look like prey to a coyote. And let's be honest, you don't want to look like prey to any animal, never mind one with such big teeth. The Mercury News notes that your reaction to a coyote should differ somewhat in the months between February and July, when coyote moms have young pups in their dens. Like most large mammals, coyotes are protective of their young and aren't going to leave the area just because you're making noise. During this time of year, you should maintain eye contact and walk away from the coyote without turning your back on it. Coyote attacks on humans are rare, but it's wise to remember that they do happen occasionally, which means you can't afford to treat a coyote encounter like a trip to the zoo. In places where coyotes and humans frequently encounter each other, coyotes may be a lot less wary and could be bolder and more aggressive than usual. In California, for example, there were 48 attacks by coyotes on adults and children between 1998 and 2003. Children are most at risk. For example, in 1981, a coyote killed a three-year-old girl who was playing alone in her front yard. But adults can be victims too. In 2009, a 19-year-old woman named Taylor Mitchell was attacked and killed by coyotes while hiking alone in the Highlands National Park in Nova Scotia. Scientists did a genetic analysis of the coyotes that attacked Mitchell and found that they were eastern coyotes, a hybrid species with genetic influence from gray wolves. Eastern coyotes are thought to be more likely to hunt in packs and may be more dangerous than their western counterparts. Most coyote encounters don't end in tragedy, but humans aren't the only species that could become the targets. Pets are at a much greater risk of becoming and coyote food. So the Humane Society recommends that people who live in or near coyote territory keep their pets indoors, especially at night. Cats are easy prey for coyotes, while small breed dogs might also be targeted. To discourage coyotes around your home, make sure all pet food is kept inside and that you don't store trash outdoors. Call your local Department of Fish and Game if there's a nuisance coyote in your neighborhood. Animals that attack pets, show no fear of humans, boldly approach people, or menace people and animals are dangerous and should be reported to authorities. You don't really need to spend too much time thinking about your local coyote neighbors, though. Humans who take the right precautions and know what to do when they come face to face with Wile E aren't going to have to worry about sharing territory. So don't let the presence of coyotes deter you from your daily walk. And don't worry too much if you'd rather just leave that anvil at home. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos. There you go. Don't worry too much about your, your coyote neighbors. You're probably pretty safe. All right, the last uh, last of our predators I want to talk about is the mountain lion. 
Now these are big kitty. This is a big kitty. Also known as a cougar or a puma or a catamount. Um, these get up to, males can be 120 to 220 pounds. Um, females between 65 and 140 pounds. Six and a half feet to eight feet from the, from the nose to the tip of the tail. That's a big cat. And between two, almost three feet tall at the shoulder. And again, in the northern part of their range, they tend to be larger. So yeah, this is the, the mountain lion's the fourth largest cat in the world. Um, it's the largest cat in the United States and the second largest cat in North America. The largest cat in North America slightly gets slightly larger than the mountain lion. It's actually the jaguar down in South America, or not in South America, Central America. So lifespan of a, of a cougar averages between eight and 13 years. So mountain lions live in a variety of habitats, but they, they prefer rougher wooded areas with a lot of cover. And again, that's because just like your house cat or the bobcat, they are an ambush predator. So they need cover for stalking and, and prey abundance tends to be higher in these areas. Like the bobcat, they're, they're crepuscular, they're most active at dusk and dawn, and their choice prey is deer. Um, they'll also attack elk horn, bighorn sheep, or elk, bighorn sheep, small game like skunks and porcupines, things like that. Um, larger prey, they'll, they'll drag under a bush after they kill it to, and cover it with litter to deter other scavengers. Now they can sprint pretty quickly, um, but they can also jump about 20 feet. So they generally kill their prey by leaping onto its back and biting its neck. And I'm gonna show you, I have a, again, this is a replica, but this is a mountain lion skull, a replica of a mountain lion skull. And I'm gonna, I'll show you the difference. Here's our bobcat. And here's our mountain lion. So while the fox and the coyote were relatively close together, the mountain lion is significantly larger than our bobcat. Now mountain lions are, are generally solitary. So the mother and the kittens will live in a group together. But other than that, adults rarely meet. Um, females, just like the bobcat, females have a much smaller territory than males. Males' territory may, may be anywhere between 60 and 300 square miles. And the female's territory is about half that size. So several females may have a territory within one male's larger territory. So sometimes the females may, may organize into something of a small community, um, just in that they may reciprocally, I can't say that word, they may share kills. So they, they may do that. Um, but otherwise, the, the adults rarely meet. Um, range size is going to depend on terrain, um, suitable den sites, and prey abundance. So larger, larger, range if there's if there's less game because they're going to have to travel farther to find suitable suitable game um, because of that the one of the main threats to mountain lions is is habitat loss and habitat fragmentation so highways are a major barrier um, to the dispersal of, of mountain lions um, the kittens will actually stay with mom for about two years so they're born with these spots um, Usually mom will have uh, one litter every two years of one to six, generally two kittens. Um, and that, unfortunately, um, everything I read said, usually only one kitten per litter will survive. So they have these spots on them that makes them very well camouflaged and those fade by about two years of age. So, at, and then at about that time, about that age, two years, they'll start dispersing. Usually the males will disperse sooner and males tend to disperse farther than the females. So in Nebraska, 
They are native to Nebraska. Sorry, my throat was getting dry. But they were eliminated from Nebraska by about the 1890s. So the first modern confirmation of mountain lions returning to Nebraska was in about 1991. Now, apparently, I didn't realize this, but apparently there's a conspiracy theory that Nebraska uh, Parks and Game reintroduced them, brought them back. And that is, that is not accurate. They were not reintroduced. Um, they are part of a larger population of mountain lions out here in the West, in Wyoming, in Colorado, and farther north up in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So the, the animals that came back to Nebraska dispersed from one of these other areas. And like, like I mentioned before, male mountain lions will, will disperse quite a ways in search of their own territory. So there are three main populations of mountain lions in Nebraska. The largest is here in the Pine Ridge, out here in the Panhandle. Um, the latest estimate there is about 34 cats, although some sources claim that, that it might be much, much higher than that. Um, the management goal is to have five to seven cats per 100 square kilometers. Um, so currently in, in the Pine Ridge, they do allow hunting. You have to have a permit and the annual harvest in that area is actually only about six cats. So it's not like hunting deer where there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. Um, other populations are in the Niobrara River Valley, over here slightly to the east, and the Wildcat Hills down here to the south. Uh, and they do move pretty freely between these other states. So they move up into South Dakota, they move back and forth between Wyoming and Colorado. Now, they do show up in Omaha from time to time. So you can see all these little orange dots are, are confirmed um, evidence of mountain lions. And I say evidence because it's not necessarily a sighting of a cat. It might be a footprint. It might be um, scat. All right, my chat window disappeared again, and I see someone had a question, so I will get to that in just a second. Let me see. Uh, about a year ago, we had a, a mountain lion south of Council Bluffs, just north of Glen, Glenwood. Yeah, so they, they do happen. They do come out here. Um, I think last year, um, towards the end of last summer, there was one out in Gretna. Um, this one down here on the right, this was in 2015. Um, that, this was um, in Southwest Omaha. And this one on the left here, this was, I want to say 2006. Um, they tranquilized this cat um, at 140th and, and Dodge. So, so they, do, they do disperse out here. And if you look at these dots, if you kind of think about what else, how they're, they're kind of in a line here, you got the Niobrara River, the Missouri, and the Platte coming through there. So those are all corridors that those usually, generally these are young males that are dispersing east. So it, it's rare, but every few years we do, we do get a mountain lion out this way. Now attacks are rare. Um, like this this picture here up on the left, you're more likely to get struck by lightning than be attacked by a mountain lion. Um, so mountain lions tend to avoid people, um, but pets can be vulnerable. So, you, you know, if you're in mountain lion territory, if you're going hiking out in the, in the panhandle or out in Wyoming or you go out to Colorado, you should know what to do if you encounter a mountain lion. So you, you face the lion, you back away slowly, Make yourself large, hold your hands up. If you have a jacket, put it over your head. Um, shout, um, pick up children. And, and if you're attacked, fight back. There was a, a guy about a year and a half ago in Fort Collins, Colorado, out trail running. Um, he was attacked by a young male mountain lion and, and he fought it off. So um, I'm gonna show you one more short video. And this is a, a gentleman mountain biking and he encounters a mountain lion and he does a pretty good job of 
of keeping himself safe. This is so crazy. Hey, Mr. Mountain Lion. How are you doing? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. I am much bigger than you. I'm way bigger than you. Go! Where are you going? Yeah, see this well? There's the mountain lion. There's a mountain lion right here. And he's just staring me down. Okay, this cat is coming back at me. This is unbelievable. There's a mountain lion right here. Right in front of me. Stay back. Stay there. I'm not afraid of you. A pretty incredible encounter. Um, and he does pretty much everything right. He, you know, he doesn't turn his back. He doesn't try to run away. He stays facing the cat. Um, the only, my only criticism, the only thing I would have done and probably wouldn't have had a lot of control over it is I would have been louder. I would have been yelling a lot more at that cat. But like I said, here at Fontenelle Forest, here in Omaha, this is mountain lion is not something you really have to, to worry about. Um, when hiking around here. They're very rare on this side of the state. So that is our program for today. Um, I do want to, I want to say I, I, I'll be back in two weeks, sort of. Um, in two weeks, we'll have another program, um, but it won't be live like this one is. I'm, I'm going to be on vacation and then I'm moving. So I, I am going to have a program put together. It will be recorded and then that link will be available to anyone who wants it. So if you'd like to become a member of Fontenelle Forest or make a donation, please feel free to, to visit our website or give us a call. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in, in booking a program like this one for, for your group, kind of a more of a private um, program, give me a call or shoot me an email here at the forest and I can get you a, a catalog and information on pricing. Uh, we do want to thank our sponsors. So because of COVID-19, we were not able to hold our, our annual fundraiser. So these uh, businesses generously still continue to, to support us and they make it possible for me to do programs like this for, for everybody during this time. Um, with that said, let me see if I can get my chat window back and I can take any questions.
Well, all right. Again, I want to thank you all for joining us either on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Um, I'm glad you, you all um, could make it. I um, hope you enjoyed this program, and we will see you in a few weeks. Thank you. You're welcome.